And now, here is your host for Law You Should Know, attorney Kenneth J. Landau. Hi, this is Ken Landau, and welcome to Law You Should Know. Today we'll be talking about understanding the LSAT, and our guest is tutor and LSAT coach who's been teaching people to do their best on the exam, Stephen Schwartz. Steve, welcome to Law You Should Know. Thank you very much for having me. Pleasure to be here. Okay, so let's start out. I noticed a lot of information you have for our listeners. Just tell us about the background, about the his- history and reliability of the LSAT. And that, if anyone doesn't know, that's the law school admission test. Yeah, sure. So the LSAT's been around since 1948. It's been the main and only law school uh, law school admission test for that entire period until recently when the GRE started making some inroads. But the LSAT has had many formats over the years. Now it's standardized since 1991 with three types of questions, logic games, logical reasoning, and reading comprehension. So how would you say it, it is in terms of difficulty or scope compared to the SAT? I would say it's significantly harder. One of the hardest things about the LSAT is that it's not like anything you've learned in school. There's no math on it. There's no vocabulary on it. That's not really what's being tested. Instead, it's testing a way of thinking, your critical thinking skills, and also your short-term working memory. So a lot of times, applicants are kind of in for a rude awakening when they first encounter it. And this is to help you succeed in law school theoretically and for success as a lawyer. Exactly. It's the, the reason the LSAT is considered a valid and reliable admission test is that it has a strong correlation with first-year law school grades. Interpreting arguments on the LSAT is very similar to interpreting fact patterns in law school itself. And, and of course, in legal reasoning, there is not necessarily one correct answer, but there are, you know, different answers and gray areas and ambiguities. That is true. And I think that the fact patterns on the LSAT, you know, they, they contain ambiguities themselves. And the job of the test taker is in part to spot what the ambiguities are. What is the gap in reasoning between the evidence and the claimed conclusion? And that, of course, will help someone when they're a law student and, and an attorney in understanding the law and its ambiguities. Exactly. Yeah, I think that the LSAT, it's testing your ability to read extremely carefully. And of course, as, as you know, as an attorney, a small wording change, a comma here and there can totally change the meaning of a contract, which could have major stakes down the road for a client. Or a missing term or fact. Same. Yes, exactly. Now, what, what can someone do, let's say, while they're in high school or college or taking a master's to help prepare for the LSAT? Well, the biggest thing I would say to anyone is if, if they're young, if they have several years ahead of them before they apply to law school is read more, read as much as you possibly can, because reading comprehension is hard to improve on overnight. But if someone is in college or a recent grad, I'd say if they're in college, there are some particular courses that may help. There's a strong correlation between your philosophy majors and high LSAT scores. I'm not sure, of course, if majoring in philosophy leads one to get the high LSAT score or if the kind of person predisposed to take a philosophy major is likely to do well. But either way, I think navigating dense text is something that certainly one does in a philosophy class. And you don't have to be a philosophy major, but you might want to take a philosophy course or two. Exactly. Yeah. You don't want to do it if it's going to kill your GPA. But if it interests you and you might do well, it could certainly help down the line. And it may help you as a lawyer, too. And what what else? What other things can someone do, or even do after college or on their own, to prepare for the LSAT? The biggest thing I would say is carve out the time. So get buy-in from your employer if you're working. Get buy-in from your family to help out to mitigate other obligations you have going on during the period that you're studying for the LSAT. Most people, especially those who are paralegals, they typically work very long hours, and that presents an obstacle to fitting in time to study for the LSAT, which is a grueling exam when you're already tired after a long day. So let's talk about how you can help people as well and how they should spend their time, whether it's with your help or on their own, studying and preparing for the LSAT. Yeah, sure. I mean, of course, I can walk people through actual LSAT problems, but sometimes what's more important is helping people study the right way. So breaking down all the released LSAT exams and giving you a plan of attack so that step-by-step and day-by-day, you know exactly what to do 
and what not to do. So one of the biggest things I have on my site are actually study schedules, helping people break down their timelines for all different periods, one month through seven months to know how to use the various LSAT prep books and free online resources. And of course, helping them to understand what they have missed in, in answering a test problem or a preparation question. Exactly. I think that a lot of students, they'll take af exam after exam and measure their results and be happy or sad about whatever they got and then move on. And I was prone to do the same, of course, back when I was studying. And it was only when I learned to examine the problems I was having difficulty with in much more detail than I previously had. That was when I started to spot my mistakes and then improve along the way. And so we don't want people under the misimpression. As you said, it's totally different from the SATs and other graduate test. So this is not something someone should go into cold. Certainly not. Yeah, there's there's absolutely no reason to do that. There's no reason to have a, a relatively lower score on your record when, of course, almost everyone improves with any degree of studying or familiarity with the exam. So you could take a diagnostic on the side, but I wouldn't take it officially just to see how you'll do. And can people take it again and again? Does it pay for them to do that? It honestly does. Law school's do not average multiple LSAT scores. They only consider the highest. And so if you studied, you take it, but you didn't do as well as you wanted to or could have, you could then retake. And there's a margin of error or a score band of three and a half points on either end. So let's say that your true aptitude is a 160. You could, through nothing more than luck or chance, score a 163 the next time. And a 163 will open far more doors for you and get you more scholarship money than a 160 will. It's kind of crazy, but even a single point can make a big difference. So you just mentioned something there that's very important. The higher the score, I mean, they, the, a school's going to look at your GPA as well, but the higher, the, and your, maybe your other background, but the higher the score, the better the school you will qualify for, and also it may open the door to financial aid, especially if you're going to a local school or a less... Uh, highly ranked school. A hundred percent. A single point more could get you thousands in scholarship money, even tens of thousands of dollars in scholarship money, or get you into a better law school. So t taking it again, if you think you could do better, is really a no-brainer. It's, it's the biggest bang for your buck you'll get. And one reason law schools do that, especially law schools, is they want to boost their standing in the rankings, which are in part based on the LSAT scores of their class. That's absolutely true. Admission officers, their, their jobs for most schools, they largely ride on how their schools do in the rankings. So their job when they're looking at who to admit is really it's based on the numbers because that's what U.S. News considers. There's your LSAT score, then your GPA, then everything else in that order. And it's kind of funny because people will spend four to five years on their undergraduate GPA, but your LSAT score, you get it in one day. So it's well worth spending more than three months on it if you think you can improve. And it's worth it to the school to attract uh, a number of people who are going to bolster the standing of that school. That's true. It's crazy. But they'll tell an applicant, we just need you to get one or two points more, and then we can admit you. And then if you come to them with one or two points more, maybe they admit you, or maybe they even give you scholarship money. And that's also why they're reluctant to admit you if you have a low score, even if your other credentials are good. Exactly. Yeah, they don't want to hurt their rankings. So what are some of the things that you can do with people to help them as, in addition to what you mentioned? I think the biggest thing is forcing people to actually sit down and engage with the problems that are giving them the most trouble. So a lot of times people will want to look at the explanations or they'll want to have me explain it to them and they'll say, oh, I get it now and then move on. But I actually have a, a dialogue with the students where I really kind of force them to think through their thought process what was tempting about a wrong answer choice that made them pick it and what ultimately makes it wrong and what was discouraging about a right answer choice that pushed them away from it and what ultimately makes it correct. You want to do that again and again and again. And of course, I work with students one on one, but I also teach live online LSAT classes where students can join from anywhere in the world. I also teach live weekend LSAT classes here in New York City. And probably, you know, foreigners may need extra help with the test. Oh, yeah, especially those who are not native English speakers, they're definitely up against initial uh, additional obstacles 
that basically they, they just require more time. And of course, I have strategies for reading comprehension for them in particular, but it is certainly a harder road for them. And so they might want to devote more time. And you, you, you customize your program, your approach, depending on the need of that student. Exactly. Yeah. I mentioned I have these study schedules on my website. Those are general, which anyone can really adapt. But for my students personally, of course, I create a customized schedule and I don't even lay it out all at once. I'll adjust it week by week based on how the student is progressing. And just taking it further about the value of a higher LSAT score, if you can achieve it, some employers look strongly at the law school and the ranking of the law school you attended and very little may mat else may matter to them in getting that first job. And they may even look at your LSAT score. It's true. It's possible. Some employers do ask for the LSAT score. Others may just look at the law school you went to, as well as how you did in the law school relative to others in your class. And so, yeah, the, the law school grades and where you went, that does come back to your LSAT score in the end. And again, the skills you give them are going to help them do better in law school, too, because it's the same uh, types of, of reasoning and skills. Definitely. Reading reading arguments, interpreting them, analyzing fact patterns, analyzing the reasoning. Those are all skills that carry forward from the LSAT into law school and beyond. So it really does start here. And what changes are coming in the administration of the LSAT in 2019? Yeah, sure. So 2019 is actually a pretty interesting year of transition for those of us who do standardized test prep for the LSAT. The exam is finally going digital. I think it's the last grad level exam to go digital after the GRE and the GMAT and such. Starting in July 2019, they're going to be administering the LSAT to half of test takers on a tablet, and the other half will get it the old, on the old paper and pencil format. But then starting this fall, September 2019, everybody's getting it administered on a tablet with a stylus, no more booklets, no more number two pencils, no more bubbling things in. And then they give you your, is, is it your choice for the, the next administration of the exam? It's funny, it's, it's actually not. So the July administration, half are assigned paper and the other half are assigned digital. And that's meant to be a kind of comparison to see how students do on each one. But regardless, the plan is to go ahead this fall, September 2019, with the digital format on the tablet. Okay, Steve, we're going to take a short break now, and we're going to give our listeners information in the second half about how they can access the many free resources you have available to them. You're listening to Law You Should Know. We're discussing understanding the LSAT with LSAT tutor Stephen Schwartz. You're on 90.3, the voice of Nassau Community College, and also over the Internet at NCC radio.org. We'll be back in a moment. Once again, we continue with Law You Should Know. From the Mineola Law Firm of Shane, Doxton, E.C. Corker, and Sauer, here is attorney Kenneth J. Landau. Hi, welcome back to Law You Should Know. We're talking to Stephen Schwartz about understanding the LSAT. He is a LSAT instructor, and he's been doing that for many years. Steve, how can someone look up the resources, the free resources, and find out more? Yeah, sure. Thanks for asking. So I've spent quite a bit of time putting these all together. They're all available for free online. The first website I created was the LSAT blog. Folks can just Google Steve Schwartz LSAT blog, and they'll find it. More recently, I've created a YouTube channel and a podcast devoted to the LSAT. It's kind of wonderful how the internet lets you go so niche on this. So the LSAT Unplugged podcast is available on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, and pretty much everywhere else. And the YouTube channel is available at youtube.com slash LSAT blog. And of course, if, any, if you or anyone you know missed any part of this particular program, you can go to the WHPC podcast at nccradio.org. Is if someone has strengths in certain areas, are they better off taking the GRE? That's a great question. I was actually speaking with an admission officer earlier today about this, and he was he's at UCLA, and he was saying that they only took five percent of their admitted students with the GRE specifically. It's really not a major focus for law schools. Some law schools have started taking the GRE, 
but the LSAT is still pretty much the main game in town. I've heard, you know, it's said that they're looking for STEM majors to become lawyers so they understand IP law and they understand, uh, you know, pa- patents and tra- trademarks and, and research and drugs, medical products, and that assorted litigation better. And uh, law schools thought the GRE might be one way of attracting those students who may feel reluctant to take the LSAT or might be taking the GRE anyway. Yeah, that's true. I think that for STEM majors, of course, if you're a STEM major, if that's your background, law schools definitely want you because STEM combined with law, that's a killer combo. But as for the GRE specifically, law schools are kind of testing it out a little bit, but it doesn't have the same valid demonstrated correlation with first year law school grades. And so I think no one's really getting in with the GRE who wouldn't have otherwise gotten in with the LSAT. And one thing I should add to this is that if someone took the LSAT as an official administration, doesn't do well, then wants to do the GRE instead, that's not really a wise course of action because once you have that LSAT score on your record, that's what's going to get factored into the U.S. news rankings. And so they'll have to consider that lower score no matter what. And again, a student can check with the admissions department of a school to see if you know they would accept the GRE instead of the uh, the, bar, the LSAT. You're saying having both doesn't work because if you did, didn't do well on the LSAT, the, that's going to hurt the school. Exactly, in terms of the rankings. And of course, there is a lot of ambiguity about this. Each law school may handle things differently. We don't know how, know how U.S. News is going to handle the GRE thing going forward. A lot of a lot of questions, not a whole lot of answers yet. So yes, I would talk to admission officers for specifics. And it could vary with schools the other year. Some of them are very focused on moving up in the rankings. And as we discussed earlier, this is one way to do that. Yeah, sure. But the top 14 law schools, I don't think they have to worry too much about that. Yes, that can worry. <laughs> And, and aside from philosophy in college or high school or in life, is it help for a student to take constitutional law or business law or something along those lines or business writing? Not really. The, the LSAT doesn't test law in any way. It only tests critical reasoning. So I think it actually has a lot more to do with philosophy and formal logic in particular than it does with the law itself. It's really more testing a way of thinking. But even those areas I mentioned, like philosophy and formal logic, studying them outside of LSAT prep is going to be of somewhat limited usefulness. I could teach someone all the formal logic they need to know in about a half an hour. It's okay. really more about a way of thinking. It's like learning a new language. And so with nearly 100 released old LSAT exams, that's the best prep material you can use. And I think we call that language legalese. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, do you have other tips and don'ts for someone studying the LCT. Yeah, sure. I would say the biggest thing, like I said, is start early. Devote more than two to three months to this process. I think that honestly, five to six months is a good amount of time for folks to reach their fullest potential. The other thing is if you're using any LSAT prep materials, make sure they're using real official LSAT questions. These are called LSAT prep tests, and you can get most of them in books of 10 on Amazon for about $20 each, and that's the best resource you can use. And just give us, tell us about your resources again. Yeah, sure. Thanks for asking again. So I have the LSAT blog. So my name is Steve Schwartz. I run the LSAT blog. Just Google me. You'll find it. I also have the LSAT Unplugged YouTube channel and podcast. I also have on-demand video courses. I teach live online LSAT classes for folks anywhere in the world. I also teach live in-person LSAT classes in New York City. So folks have a lot of options to work with me. And then, of course, I do offer one-on-one help as well. And especially if someone's taking it once and wants to boost that score, the one-on-one help might be, you know, best for them. Yeah, I think one-on-one help is certainly the best option for those who can afford it. But if not, the classes I teach are typically in small groups of no more than five to ten students. And then, of course, there's the on-demand video courses as well as a variety of different resources, written resources like guides, checklists, cheat sheets, explanations, and, of course, the study schedules I mentioned. And so you're going to help them with test-taking methods as well as the skills they need. Exactly. I think that there are the sections of the exam, like I mentioned, logic games, logical reasoning, and reading comprehension. Then there's also mindset. Then there's also the test-taking strategies, as you mentioned, like pacing and endurance, time management, process of elimination, and things of that nature. And when you say mindset, you're going to help them relax and be 
confident, though, that they will be able to focus on what they need to do that day of the test? Exactly. And that involves a bit of focus training. That involves properly simulating test day conditions to help folks overcome any kind of anxiety or nerves that they might face, because that is a big thing, of course. And do you have any other tips for someone who's applying to law school aside from the LSAT? I think the, the biggest thing is start the entire process earlier than you think you need to. So that involves requesting letters of recommendation from professors or employers, starting to work on your law school personal statement, thinking of any optional essays or addenda that you may need to write, and of course, working on your resume as well. So it is, it is a, a long process and it's, it takes longer than people think it does. And then the other thing I would add is apply to more law schools than you think you might need to. Some folks only apply to three to four schools and they're really limiting themselves. I think that honestly, 10 to 12 schools is not too many, especially then you get some offers from them. You can play them off each other to negotiate scholarships, which is huge. And you also, your plans could change. So it's always good to do a REIT school, a school that's away, a school that's nearby, just and, and schools, some schools offer part-time programs, some offer joint degrees. So you want to check out all those things, and, and you do want to find out what LSAT score you're going to need to get into that school, and maybe what LSAT score you're going to need to get some financial, for some merit-based financial aid. Oh, definitely. I think that you want to have, so as you mentioned, a, a good target could be four reach schools, four target or match schools, and four safety schools, and you can decide how each school factors in based on the L published LSAT and GPA medians of the previous matriculating class. So these numbers are available online, even on LSAC's website. LSAC is the Law School Admission Council. They're the folks who create the LSAT and they've kind of compiled all that data for applicants so they can figure out where they have a realistic shot. And c can you go back to the scoring of the LSAT? What kind of scales are done on and what type, what is considered a good score? What What's considered a score that you need to get into better schools? Yeah, sure. So I would say that the LSAT is on a scale of 120 to 180, 120 being the lowest, 180 being the highest. The median LSAT score is around a 151, so it's almost perfectly in the middle. A good score, I would say, is anything 160 or above. A 170 is the 97th percentile. And that's typically getting about 10 questions wrong. So it's kind of a crazy scale when you think about it, that you could get 10 wrong out of the 100, meaning a 90% accuracy rate, yet scoring in the top 3% of all test takers. So it is quite a difficult exam, and the timing is part of that. And guessing, you're better off not guessing unless you can make an educated guess? You should always guess because there's no guessing penalty. So at the five-minute warning or when you have only two minutes left, you may want to bubble in all the remaining answers just so you have your bases covered. But but you're going to teach people strategies for pacing themselves and for, for guessing if they have to. Absolutely. Yeah, there's a strategy for everything, and we have to think about all of these things because it's not just about getting the questions right. It's about getting them right under timed, realistic test day conditions, which is a whole other aspect of it. I think that LSAT prep has three phases, accuracy, then pacing, then the endurance. Okay, let's fast forward. Someone took your programs. They got into the law school of their choice. But are they going to be happy being a lawyer? That's a great question. Honestly, I'm not sure I'm the one who can answer that. I didn't go to law school myself. I got kind of weirdly sidetracked and obsessed with, with the LSAT itself. And so I think for those who aren't sure whether law school is right for them, I would definitely recommend taking a step back, talk to some actual real attorneys, find them, call them up. Don't just rely on what you and see on you TV. And maybe you want to work at the, the paralegal. Maybe you want to work as an intern. And so you can really see what goes on the law, what type of environment it is, whether people are happy there. A hundred percent. I think that's enormously valuable research to do before even taking the first step of starting a study for the LSAT. Because law school is a big financial commitment. It's a big commitment in time. This is assuming you overcome the hurdle of the LSAT. Certainly. And I think that's part of why, given that it is such a big commitment of time and money, if you decide that you do want to pursue it, getting the highest possible LSAT score is the best thing you can do to get into a better law school or minimize the debt that you're taking on. And it, Right. And minimizing debt is very important as well. Certainly. Any final thoughts, Steve, and just give us your, you know, your, where people can find your LSAT helpful info. Yeah, sure. Thanks. So I think the, the biggest thing is, of course, feel free to reach out and start the process early for the studying. 
If you'd like to reach out to me, you can email me at lsatunplugged.gmail.com. You can visit my website, the LSAT blog. You can also check out the LSAT Unplugged YouTube channel and podcast available on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, and everywhere else. And they should just Google you for that. Yeah, just Steve Schwartz LSAT blog or the search the, the YouTube and the podcast. And do you get feedback that uh, people who you've helped to do well in the LSAT have enjoyed uh, law? That's, that's a great question. Um, I do hear from folks who have gone forward their first year associates, they're a couple years in, they like it, they're usually very busy and very overworked, but I'd say that the majority of them are happy. But I also really talk with my students during the process and ask them, are you sure this is the path you wanna do? Are you sure law school's right for them? And I've actually convinced a number of people not to pursue this path. So it's something and that- sometimes it's good to work for a while. Sometimes it's, you know, people even go to law school as a second career and later in life. Yeah, certainly. It'll always be there available for you when you need it, when you want to pursue it. In the meantime, of course, there's no harm in t slowing it down for a minute and, of course, saving up a couple of years' worth of salary to help pay for it. Okay. I'd like to thank Stephen Schwartz, our LSAT tutor, for all the valuable information. Remember, if you missed any part of this or you want to hear it again or let someone else know about it, you can just go to nccradio.org and, and find our podcast. And please feel free to join us next week at this same time for Law You Should Know on WHPC 90.3, the voice of Nassau Community College, and also over the Internet at nccradio.org. Thanks for tuning into the show. Please subscribe if you haven't done so already to be notified of new episodes as I release them. And feel free to reach out if you need anything at all as you move forward with your prep. I'm happy to help however I can. In the meantime, I wish you all the best and take care.